Hi guys. It's um It's Ash. And welcome to um to Fiction Addiction where where today we're playing Oh god. Oh god. I just barfed out everything I had inside me and and I still can't get rid of the disappointment. Good lord, PK out of the shadows. So if you have eyes in your head, you can tell that this is a game where Donald Duck is a superhero. But not just any superhero. He's PK, also known as Pepperinic or the Duck Avenger, an Italian superhero identity created for him in the 60s and the star of a really awesome comic I read as a child in the 90s. In fact, I made a whole video about this comic, which you can watch by clicking the card in this video. And um, considering this isn't that well known, I actually suggest you go do that, because some parts of this video might not make a whole lot of sense otherwise. But anyway, I loved that comic as a kid, and while I was the only one I knew who read it, it brought me a lot of joy. So imagine my delight when one day while at the mall with my parents, I realized that an actual PlayStation 2 video game of it existed. That there was a game where I got to fly around with PK's X Transformer Shield, fight the Eronians, the Raider 2, all those guys, and generally be a really badass duck nut named Scrooge. Now, I was never the kid who could just ask for a game and get it, and I didn't have an awful lot of money myself, so this was very much the game that got away from me. At least until it reappeared on the PS Store for like two bucks or something. And thank Christ it did and I didn't pay full price for it back then, because it's ass! PK Out of the Shadows was released on PlayStation 2 and GameCube in the year 2002, and at first glance it looks like exactly what you'd expect, a 3D platformer with some shooty action. Sounds about perfect for a game where you play a Super Donald, and I really enjoy platformers in the first place, so hey, I'm all in. And hey look, one is there! And the Eronians and their ships look comic book accurate. And it's made by Disney Interactive, who have given us a few decently fun games, as well as Ubisoft, who can definitely deliver awesomeness. So surely it can't be all bad. YES IT FUCKING CAN! Also, out of the shadows? Really? What is that even supposed to mean here? Is this where Michael Bay got his subtitle for his second Turtle movie? Actually, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't put it past him. Anyway, since there's fuck all to do in the main menu, not even any game options other than sound, I guess we better start. So basically, the game wastes no time and throws you directly into a cutscene that shows the Eronians, the alien emotion vampires from the comics, getting ready to invade Earth. And I will say, to the game's credit, the intro cutscene being framed like a comic book is pretty cute. And look, there's Suster and Sundak, two of the more recognizable Eronians from the comics. That's pretty neat. Except for the part where they sound like this. All soldiers ready to leave the mothership. We can launch the invasion now, General. <laughs> Proceed. Oh, fantastic. It took like three seconds for our main villains to go from terrifying alien generals to purple pirate Daffy Duck and half-asleep male sex hotline worker. Watch me quiver in terror at the might! We then cut to Docklair Tower, where Donald is falling asleep on his current security guard job. Oh, Donald, huh? you've got to control your temper, or I don't know what I'm gonna do with you. What's going on? Well, that's what I want to know! Don't get mad at me. You're the one with the temper. And another thing. Ha 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 ha. Uncle Donald got punished by Daisy again. <laughs> Listen here, you snooping little shits. You know perfectly well that a sailor hat on the doorknob means Uncle and Daisy are having private time. You're in even bigger trouble than Uncle was. And unlike him, you brats don't get a safe word. But seriously though, I, this is how you want to start your game? I mean, I get that Donald is supposed to be this everyman character who nothing ever goes right for. But how shitty does your self-esteem have to be in order for you to dream about your girlfriend skyping you at work just to shit-talk you while your adopted children laugh at your pain? So anyway, Donald is feeling inadequate and wants to show his shitty family what he can do. So, you'd like to be a superhero, hmm? What? I'll take that as a yes. And just like that, one sucks Donald into a tube, shoves him in a superhero outfit, starts calling him PK, and sends this random, temperamental, middle-aged apartment building night watchman out the door to fight off an alien invasion. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, everything apparently. 
Oh, but of course it doesn't do this without first putting Donald through some hilarious wardrobe hijinks. Ah, that's not it. Yeah, remember that part in the comics where Donald was already a veteran superhero before meeting one? How he found the secret floor in Dockler Tower all on his own just by being observant, and how the two started a genuine partnership? Fuck that! Mumbling the word superhero in your sleep is a perfectly passable origin story. Yep, yep, yep! Cut, print, put it in a Superman reboot! I mean, holy shit, the game hasn't even started and there's already so much wrong with this! Like I said, the presentation is somewhat decent and all characters look the part, but nothing here makes a lick of goddamn sense! It just immediately completely abandons everything that made the edgy take on PK work and throws the dumbest excuse plot I've ever seen straight at you. And even if you make the admittedly perfectly valid point that the game was likely made for new players that haven't read the comic and thus it can't rely too much on it, this complete lack of any explanation just makes things more confusing. I mean, put yourself in the mind of a newcomer and try to make sense of this intro. Who are these purple guys? What's this tower? Why is Donald a security guard? Who the hell is this green orb dude? What the hell is an Eronian? Why are they attacking Earth? Who are these two dinguses? Why does green orb dog call Donald PK? Yeah. What is a PK? How do you like your cool new voice? Oh, is that what you call it? Cause it sure fucking sounds an awful lot like Rob Paulson half-assing his way to a paycheck. All right, let's do it. Also, why is he even called PK? In the US, it's always been either Duck Avenger or Super Duck. And PK is a shortening of his Italian name Paparinic. So, so how do they explain that one? What on earth does PK mean? PK stands for the scientific Latin classification Platyrhynchos Connecticus. Translated loosely, it means energized duck. Oh, I get it. It's because this cutscene keeps going and going and going and going and going and going and going. Okay, so we're finally actually playing the goddamn game after enduring five minutes of cutscenes that felt a lot more like 50 and we get a sense of what we're dealing with. Basically, we're in classic 3D platformer territory. You run, you jump with the X button, you aim with R2, and you shoot pew pew pellets with square to take out enemies. And you get to stare at Donald's plump, shapely, latex-clad, wobbling ass the whole time. It's very standard fare. And I really hope you like hearing PK go WOW, because he does it every other freaking jump! WOW! 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 So we start out playing our way through this observatory state and shoot some cool flames, that is, aliens enslaved by Eronians, until you get to this one jump you can't make. Which makes Donald stand there like a dumb fuck trying to figure out how physics work. Turns out you need an upgrade for your shield to make the jump, which is conveniently located right in the next room. One, of course, helpfully explains how to use it. Now try jumping across to that area over there by using your X-Transformer's Propulsor. The Propulsor will help soften your landings and prolong your jumps. Do you mind telling me what that looks like? Oh yeah, that sure looks a lot like flying, doesn't it? Soaring through the air, high speed movement. You know, that thing Donald does constantly in the comics and is one of the shield's main functions? Along with the extender arm he uses to punch foes, and the paralyzer array, and the hologram projection? Yeah, take a wild guess how many of these are in the game. <laughs> That's right, fucking none of them! Instead, every time you get an upgrade, it's boring stuff like punching crack walls, charging your shot, taking slightly less damage, and swinging from orbs. Oh, except for the part where you get the ability to detach the shield instead of flying through narrow passages you gotta navigate in order to open locked doors. Which means that the shield can fly, but the makers of this game deliberately chose not to let you use it that way. Or as, you know, an actual goddamn shield. Literally, all you can do in this game, where you play as a superhero duck carrying a high-tech device packed with weapons in the source material, is jump, strafe, glide, and shoot. Let me reiterate, I am actually playing a 2002 PlayStation 2 game where only three of my 12 available buttons actually do diddly fuck. I mean, this is just inexcusable. Like, honestly, someone actually explained this to me. Why are the upgrades just lying around in there instead of having one introduce the functions of the shield as you need them? Like he'd actually have to do if he sent an inexperienced fighter off with a high-tech weapon and no training. How does it make sense in terms of story or game design to have the upgrades placed literally right next to you the first time you run into an obstacle that requires them and force you to actually go physically grab it instead of just unlocking it on the spot?
And maybe, just maybe, I'd feel a little better about this if the moves you did have worked decently. Honestly, this is kind of hard to explain. Strictly speaking, the game works well enough. Donald jumps when you tell him to, shoots when you tell him to, strafes when you tell him to, aims when you tell him to. But everything just feels so goddamn weird. The physics of Donald's jumping look and feel like somewhere between a sack of potatoes and a feather. Both his jumps and his falls are just so slow. But to the game's credit, that's probably what would happen if you slapped the superhero costume on a pear-shaped middle-aged security guard. Also, Donald's strafing animation makes him look like he's sneaking off to steal from the cookie jar. But anyway, moving through the level, you may also notice these two counters at the bottom. The 15 refers to these one orbs, which you need to grab 15 of in order to activate each checkpoint as you get to them. Which are all marked with one's face, because that's how you keep your highly advanced AI a secret, I guess. I'm assuming this is where the challenge is supposed to be, but honestly, if you're even half awake while playing this, the orbs are around in abundance, and you have to make an actual effort to not activate a checkpoint. The other counter refers to one of the most annoying parts of the game, namely the six kidnapped scientists that are placed in each level. Basically, you have to save at least 40 out of the 60 total of these in the game in order to access the final mothership level. Once you enter a section where there are scientists to be rescued, a timer starts, and you have to get to them quickly, either finding them hidden behind objects or shooting some enemies to rescue them in time. And if you fail, you get to watch them melt like the Wicked Witch of the West. Also, whenever you're near a scientist saving segment, they make this noise. Which sounds a lot less like someone who got tied up and is calling for help, and a lot more like someone tied themselves up and is waiting for you to come ravish them. Save me. So, that's all you do every level. You move forward, you shoot Ebronians and cool flames, you collect orbs and you rescue scientists. All of which is pretty easy if it wasn't for the goddamn fixed camera. Yeah, that's right, you can't actually control the camera. In this PlayStation 2 game from 2002. Nope, you're stuck with whatever angle the game decides on from screen to screen. And that would be fine if the game was designed with this in mind and smoothly transitioned due to new angles, but instead it just snaps like a bad guy's neck in an 80s action movie, instantly disorienting you and allowing enemies to shoot your ass from off-screen. I died a lot in this game, but it was rarely from actual combat. It was most often a combination of crappy camera angles, enemies shooting at me from off-screen and coming running out of the walls, or long slow jumps that somehow still didn't allow me time to glide back and recover. So it's frustrating as hell, but not entirely unplayable, and eventually you do start to get the hang of it somewhat and make your way through the game. You grab some more orbs, you save some more scientists, and you shoot more cool flames and Ebronians. And I really hope you like those guys, because outside from these explodey Robobucks, they are the only enemy types you ever meet, with only minor variation. Ooh, look! This cool flame can jump! Ooh, the Ebronians shoot a few single bullets and then a row, and this Ebronian only shoots the rows, and this Ebronian can fly! Variety! But the worst enemy in the game has got to be the goddamn shielded Ebronians! A little bit into the game, you come across an Evronian you can't shoot, and then get the ability to charge your shots to break his shield. So you dodge his shots, wait for an opening, charge, shoot, and then blast away. Now that sounds fair enough, but there are just a few teeny tiny little problems. See that green meter? Yeah, that's the energy you need to charge, and if you get hit, it depletes. So if you don't have any, you can't charge, and you have to shoot at the shielded Evronian until it drops health, which also replenishes the meter. So now you gotta wait for an opening again, and then shoot. And even without that annoyance, it usually takes three rounds of this nonsense to take them down with regular shots. And even with the various upgraded ammo you can find, which all do literally nothing other than increase the damage output and never play in it differently, it still usually takes two, making these enemies really goddamn tedious to deal with. And the game likes to use them a lot. Sometimes even two at a time. Donald Duck Superhero Fun! Seriously though, that's a grand total of seven enemy types across the whole game. Four of which are just minor variations of the initial two. I mean, imagine playing a modern Mario game, where literally all you fight throughout are just Koopas and Goombas with or without wings, and one very occasional hammer bro. That is what this game is. So you blast, collect, rescue, and wow! your way through the levels, and eventually you get out of the frozen observatory. Wow! Being a hero is way too simple! Good. Then you are off to your next assignment. What? Already? Hey, don't I even get a coffee break? No rest for the weary. My scanners have been picking up abnormal activities in the Nevada desert. And it's all the goddamn same. You get to see some yellow rocks, but you still get the same floors full of insta-kill goop, the same electric obstacles, the same security cameras, the same bullshit all around. Good fucking grief. 
So after more levels of the same shit, you finally get to the first of the levels two, yes, two whole boss fights. Saster the Aronian Scientist. He welcomes you with a menacing laugh. <laughs> and the fight against his huge deadly war machine begins, and... He plays exactly the same as a shielded Eronian. Aim, dodge the shots, wait for a good moment, charge, shoot, shoot the exposed weak point. Repeat three times and down he goes. hip ho fucking ray Do not think that this is over just yet, Earthling. <laughs> Come in, PK! Get back to Duckler Tower fast! Eronians are... everywhere! Oh yeah, now we're talking! Docklayer Tower, an actual location from the comics that is armed to the teeth with high-tech security system! Oh, this is gonna be epic- OH COME ON! More goop floors, more electric fences, more narrow passages, it's exactly the goddamn same! I mean, how? How the hell does this game actually manage to make a frozen laboratory, the Nevada desert, and a high-tech inner-city skyscraper look and feel the exact same? It's not like this is a long game. There is no excuse to not switch things up a little beyond introducing one new obstacle every other level that you need a shield upgrade for. But no, just throw the same shit in there. Because obviously the Eronians took the time after their invasion to tear up the floors and fill the holes with their insta-kill alien jizz. Wouldn't you? Oh, and your final shield upgrade also gives you a new costume because plot reasons, and you can now switch between the costumes as you please with the circle button. Ooh, a whole four buttons are used now. But the last power-up you need to progress is only usable with a new costume, so you have literally zero reason to switch back. And finally, it's time to fight the final boss, Sundag. So, how can this be possible? <laughs> One measly little person causing so much trouble. Come, bow before the mighty General Zondag, or feel my wrath. Ew, what's with that heavy breathing? He sounds like the kind of guy who calls up girls' dormitories just to moan on the phone. Hello? So... Hello? Hello? Come. Hey, quiet! It's him again! <laughs> the Mona! I mean, hell, he's probably the one the scientists are waiting for. Save me. Come. God, I need help. Either way, Sundeck sucks and he's a chore to fight. First, you stand on this platform to avoid his attacks for a while, using your charged shot to bounce this disco ball back at him until eventually it actually hurts him. You only need to do this three times, but it takes a little longer each time, and it takes forever. We then switch to his second form, which is basically just him getting out of his goddamn chair, and you spend your time dodging shockwaves to, yet again, shoot at him to lower his shield. Now, we've been shooting at a lot of Eronian shields in this game, so we know the drill by now, right? You know, dodge the shots, charge your own shot, break the shield, and blast away. Must be exactly the same here. Nope, it's the exact fucking opposite. Shoot away at his shield with regular shots, wait for it to crack, and then take a charge shot at him. Do this five times and you win. That is, assuming you don't fall off the sides and die when he starts using wind to blow you back and have to fight the first form all over again. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> but with a little tenacity, you finally beat him, the mothership blows up, and you get to watch the just hilarious ending. Thanks for giving me a chance. Oh, no problem. Just tell me when you're ready to start your real training. Okay, okay. Can we just rest for a moment, please? I mean, saving the world takes a lot out of you, you know. How about some pizza? Why not? Oh, no! Is that what I think it is? <laughs> well, duck me, that was terrible. What a foul game indeed. Now... I know what you're probably thinking. I'm expecting way too much for a game made for kids that haven't read the comic book, but what about the kids that did read it? What about the kids that were fans? What about the kids that could have been exposed to the awesomeness they have to offer for the first time and become fans? Look, my problem isn't that the game is easy or simple or short. I mean, I love action platformers. I would have been perfectly happy with a simple, to-the-point game that just played decently. And my problem isn't that it's a complete technical mess either, because it kind of isn't. I mean, it's frustrating and it manages to be tedious and repetitive even though it's very short and it's not very polished, but it's not unplayable. No, it's worse. It's lazy. This game came out in 2002. There were 68 issues of the comics to take material from. There were tons of cool villains to use as bosses, cool vehicles, cool equipment to include. 
You could have had an extending fist as a weapon. You could have used the shield to do dash attacks or flying segments. You could chase the raider across Dockburg. You could fight two inside Dockler Tower. You could confer with Lila between missions. Catch criminals with your paralyzer ray. Travel through time to interesting locations. Fly the P-car from mission to mission or, you know, use any other of his 500 different vehicles. Or at the very least, give PK more of an origin story than mumbling the word superhero in his sleep. And you know what? Even if they had a low budget, which is probably true, and even if they had to keep it short because of some looming preset release date, and even if they just wanted to focus on the Eronians, there's still plenty of material to play with. Trauma, Gorthan, Grodon, Raghorn is mutant Eronians, the fake future Eronians from issue 5, the Earth military, the Serpians, Sadum, the goddamn Eronian Emperor. They had all this stuff to play with. But all we get is a few shots of some of their spaceships, a few variations of the same basic soldiers, and arguably the least interesting of all the named Ebronians as a final boss. And that is it! So that forces me to believe one of two things. Either the game was given to a team that did little more research than skimming the first issue to make sure they got a name or two right, or it was given to a team that knew full well what they were sitting on and deliberately chose to put in the barest minimum possible effort for a passing grade. And I'm not sure which is worse. I am a firm believer that you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time you make a movie or a game or whatever. But I do believe that you need to at least give a shit. This game doesn't. You don't even get anything for rescuing all 60 scientists. Nothing. No extra levels, no new boss, no new costumes, no extra play modes, nothing. Why do Disney games keep refusing to reward their players? Even Rob Paulson, who I really don't want to disrespect because I love him and his work, sounds like he's phoning it into a point where you could tell me it was just an impersonator and I would totally believe you. All in all, this is the video game equivalent of a kid basing his book report on nothing but the back cover and handing it in without proofreading. It blows. PK Out of the Shadows may look like a Dog Avenger. It may even occasionally quack a bit like a Dog Avenger, but it certainly isn't one. No, it's a lazy, hastily spat out piece of fluff that goes out of its way to ignore its own potential. And that, in my book, is a way worse crime than trying to make a good game and failing along the way. <sighs> I need to play a good superhero game. Imagine playing a modern Mario game where literally all you fight throughout are just Gooba- Goobas? Do you know the Goobas? It's, it's a gooey bass. Like the fish, but gooey. I write jokes. Oh yeah, now we're talking! Docklear Tower! An actual location from the games that is armed to teach- Armed to teach? I am armed to teach. I have brought algebra books. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I'm done rambling about Duck Superheroes for now, but if you'd like me to talk more about the comic books in the future, please let me know in the comments. There's still plenty of Duck Avengers to go through. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel for more reviews, top 10s and other nerdy goodness, or to check out my social media sites, which you can find in the description below. And finally, thanks to John Aldjets, Kevin McRae, Warren Miller, and my other patrons for their support. If you'd like to support me as well, you can find my Patreon link in the description along with all the other links. See you next time, folks!